go, Allison. Praise the Lord. God's using you at a young age. And being difficult to sing, but then looking at out at faces staring at you is a different thing. Amen. So praise the Lord. Thank you, Allison, for that and for everybody leading us in worship and praising the Lord today. Well, as we look at the Word of God this morning, many of you may be familiar about the story of the elderly man and the younger friend that both of them chose to uh, go out playing golf one morning. And uh, there's a little hum back here behind me. And so they decided they would uh, play golf. And they were on the 12th hole, and all of a sudden, this funeral possession goes by the golf course. And this older man, he begins to kneel, go to his knees, he takes off his hat, he lays down his club, and he does his hands like this the whole time that funeral possession goes by the golf course. And the younger guy that was with him said, I am so impressed. I have never seen anybody that thoughtful, that honoring for a funeral possession to do this right in the middle of us playing golf. I'm just so impressed. I've never seen a more thoughtful act in my life. He said, well, we were married 40 years. I thought that's the least I could do. As funny as that is, that's how a lot of people treat God. A little nod at church, a little thing, one little prayer every now and then, to believe that really is all they're going to honor God. Like this man thought that would be honoring to his wife. We have to realize how, how sincere we need to be in our relationship with the Lord that he deserves much more than a little nod and a little acknowledgement, but he deserves our life, our all. And this morning, as we look at one passage, I think that brings it all to fold is in Mark 12, 28. It says, One of the scribes came and heard them arguing, and recognizing he had answered them well, that is Jesus, asked him, that's Jesus, what commandment is the foremost of all? In other words, what's the greatest commandment of all the commandments? Jesus answered, the foremost, is the greatest, is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Oops, that needs to go back. There should be some circles there. Anyway, Look at all those alls. Those aren't sums. Those aren't kind of. Those are all. All part of my being. A lot of people read this and they think, well, isn't there any left for my wife? Isn't there any left for my kids? I mean, if I give it all to the Lord, that's not how it works. You know, you give your all to the Lord, you give Him first place. You give Him everything, all your being, just like you may give all your being to love your wife and all your being to love your children, but many times and much of the time people love their spouse, their family, and their careers and other things more than they love the Lord. As we look at this, we begin to think, you know, the Lord deserves all of me. And you look at that aspect, you really can't even break it down, but if you were to break it down, you could say this, you know, I want to love the Lord in, in everything I think about. I want to love the Lord in how I feel about things. I want to love the Lord in the decisions I make. I want to love the Lord in how I serve and how I use my time. You know, me, if you're familiar, that I guess about my 11th grade in, in high school, I began to race motocross for about four years. And as a young person doing this, obviously, it was uncharacteristic of me because I was the guy that wanted to be in or was in honor society in this and did this and that and doing something that would risk one's life was not me. What one will do to try to impress girls is beyond me, but it will happen because <laughs> straight A's just didn't seem like that was it. You know, you had to kind of do something a little more. So I grew my hair out long and thought, I'll do something uncharacteristic of me. We began to race motorcycles and, and, you know, of course there's usually about 28 people in your class and this going back to school and 
saying, well, how'd you do? Well, I took 13th, or I took 12th. That just didn't seem real impressive. You know, even though you'd beat another 13, 14, 15 guys, coming in 13th or 12th place wasn't that great an accomplishment to me. And so as I raced a couple of years, it's like, well, I, it just, it's just not getting up there. Who in the world are these people up there in first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth place? I have no idea. What are they doing? I was racing as fast as I could. Well, I don't know what, but some thought dawned on me. I don't know if I had an insane moment or what. But it's like, you know what? Maybe, you know, I'm riding as fast as my body's saying, you know, if you go anymore, you're going to kill yourself. And I began to say, then I guess that's what it is. I'm valuing my life too much. I need to get out there and sit in every corner and every jump thinking this is as fast as you go. Otherwise, you're going to kill yourself. Then I guess I'll just have to kill myself. Because I'm going to ride way above my head, way above my skills, and I'm just going to ever turn, ever jump. I'm going to say, then I guess they'll carry on from the stretcher either dead or paralyzed because I'm going to race that way. And so... There begins the eighths and the sixths and the fifths and the thirds and the seconds and the first and the first and the first and the seconds and the thirds and the first and the second. And everything changed around. Now, I don't know if everybody out there had that same revelation. They may have just got better. But what I had realized that I, I, I guess my brain was saying, you know, your life's worth it to not get killed for this. But when I changed it around, no, no, a first place trophy is worth it to get killed over. And then God used that in my teenage years to really, as I was in church, had been raised in church, made a decision as a small child, begin to say, you know what? You don't serve me with that kind of passion that you race motocross with. There used to be t-shirts guys would wear, I sleep, eat, breathe, and drink motorcycles. Which is kind of what this passage just says about God. And he began to deal with me to say, you don't have that same whole hog or none, passion, I'm going to do it, I'm going to give it my best with me. I'm just kind of part of your life, but not passionately, sacrificially, willing to do anything. Not for a little trophy, but for God. I was loving motocross with all my heart, Mind, soul, and strength. And if my life cost me my life, so let it be. And God spoke to me, and I think He allowed that to happen for me to get the message that you, if you're going to pour all your heart into that, why can't you pour all your heart into me? It's really what I heard was the word hypocrite in my spirit. That this is more important than me, and God did a work those years to change my heart. You know, look at all the examples of this attitude in the scriptures. Your work, what you do on the job site. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than men. You don't work haphazard or half-hearted. I don't know why that didn't, yeah. The church at Laodicea, I know your deeds that they are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my, out of my mouth. Do <laughs> you hear what he's saying here? Either be cold, nothing for the Lord, just out there, at least you're not ruining God's testimony. You don't have what God has for you, and you won't because you're cold out there. Or be hot for me, passionate, full of Jesus, wanting to serve me whole hog or none, like I was with motocross. But don't be in the middle. Don't be lukewarm right in the middle. Who wants that? Who wants, have you ever ordered a restaurant? Give me a lukewarm glass of iced tea. Have you ever said, give me some lukewarm coffee? Bring that to my table. I need some lukewarm coffee. No. Our passion is for hot or cold. And God's passion is for hot or cold. And it seems as though it nauseates God. Because the my mouth is his mouth and he'll spit you out of my mouth. That really doesn't taste good in the palate to have something lukewarm. There's no passion there. There's no, there's no drive. There's no whole hog or none attitude for the Lord. You know, there was a king 
Amaziz, it says, He did what was right in the sight of, in the eyes of God. Well, that sounds good, that first part, doesn't it? Doing what was right. But he didn't do what was right wholeheartedly, with all his heart. You know, isn't that what you tell your kids? I mean, if they may be uh, a C student. And if they're not doing C work, you know, you may say, you're not giving it your whole heart. And if they're an A student making B, you're just saying, you're not putting your whole heart into it. You're not asking for more than they can do. You're asking for all the heart that they have in to give it all of it that they've got. Whatever it is they have. Not so with this king. Matter of fact, the dictionary defines wholeheartedness as completely and sincerely devoted, determined, and enthusiastic, marked by complete earnest commitment, free from all reserve or hesitation. I mean, just like I was there in motorcar, no hesitation. You've you got to quit drawing the line that this is all I'm going to do. I'm going to do more. I'm going to do all that God asked me to know we all fall short. And I'm not saying I don't fall short and that we don't fall short, but we have to have a passion to do the way the Lord asked us to do. We look at King Solomon. His heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord, his God. What a testimony. It wasn't holy. It sounds like it was partly. I'm sure if he gave his testimony one Sunday at church, he said, I'd like to get up here. I am partially devoted to God, praise the Lord. Some people are not even that. Right? I mean, his neighbor wasn't. His bosses wasn't. His co-workers wasn't. I am partially devoted to God, praise God. Well, that didn't cut any mustard with the Lord. He wasn't fully devoted. You know, and then Caleb, we see him. He had a different spirit. That was praise the Lord. And has followed me fully. You see, this does make a difference to God. He sees our passionate or non-passionate heart. Look, what I'm about to say, I don't want any student or parent to misunderstand me here because I'm a former school teacher in public school and former school administrator. So don't get me wrong that I don't want our kids to do their best because I do. And you should do your best. But 50% of CEOs of Fortune 500 companies had a C average in college. That was the best they could do. The CEOs of Fortune 500 companies were C students. That's the best they could do. They did their best and they were passionate about what they did. They did things fully. They got excited and they lead their companies with passion. The passion made up for their, so to speak, lack of intelligence. That was the best they could give out was a C. And you need to give your best. If your best is an A, you should give an A. But passion makes up the difference of what you think you may not be smart enough. You know, nearly 75% of all U.S. presidents were in the bottom half of their class in school. 75%. But they made up for it in passion, enthusiasm, excitement, doing their best. You see, so you can't look and say, well, I guess I can't do my best because my best's not good enough. Give all you got. Wouldn't you rather have, I mean, if you had somebody to be in the foxhole uh, with you that was a Christian, would you rather have somebody with 5% Bible knowledge and 95% passion or 95% Bible knowledge and 5% passion? I mean, give me the person with the most passion. They may not know much of the Bible and they could, should keep learning and they will because they got the passion. They're going to move forward. For the Lord. They're going to be there. They're going to fight. They're going to claw. They're going to, they're going to serve the Lord with great enthusiasm. You know, a friend of Oswald Sanders, who led a big Christian outreach ministry, he looked back at his life after he got old and said, you know what? I look at my greatest failures. You know what my greatest failures were? They were, they came from insufficient daring. That's what he looked like in his life. He said, man, my failures wasn't where I messed up. The failures were that I didn't sufficiently dare to do more for God. Just dare to do it. Whether I fell on my face, whatever happened, I at least got out there and did it. But looking back, I didn't go out there just to do it daring enough. I didn't take enough risk. I didn't take enough chances in the sense of, I'm going to step out and do this for God. And that's why he was a little depressed in his life. Not because of his failures, because of his lack of trying more. We're going to look at a few principles here so that we can all include myself and God's already beat me up so you get next stand in line of how can we judge ourselves to see if we're really passionately 
serving the Lord? Are we rationally or are we passionately serving the Lord? We've got to look. And you may look at these and say, Brother Tim, those, those sound like relationship principles. That's because our relationship with the Lord is what matters. We're not in religion. If we took a poll here and said, how many people like religion? It would be pretty low. It's not religion, it's relationship. Yes, relationships are in this church, and the church may be considered a religion, but it's a relationship that matters. That's why a lot of people bail out of church. That's why a lot of young people bail out of church, because they think, well, that's just religion. No, it's a relationship. And these principles show us how we can really passionately love the Lord. So we begin to look at them one by one. First of all, passionate love sets priorities for the one love, the exclusivity clause. Jesus said, seek ye third. Uh, no, sorry about it. Seek ye second. No, a little clear. It's, uh, it's seek ye first. The kingdom and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Things that are second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, you know, it's not regulated. Put God first. And all these things will be taken care of. He, he has to have first place. You know, it's, it, if you look at, a, say, a dating relationship between two people that date, what if the guy comes up to the girl and says, you know what, and, you know, as we're going to be dating, and I just want to let you know that while we're dating, I probably will have one or two other girlfriends. And... One of them is going to be first place. It's not going to be you, but you're going to be second place. And you know, there are billions of people in the world, billions of women in the world, and of all those women, you are going to be my second priority. Bless God. And all those other women you beat, you ought to be proud that you're with me because I got you as number two. She said, I got one for you right here, number one. <laughs> You better hope that girlfriend doesn't have her carry license because you, you, you're going to drop dead then. Why such radicalism with her? I mean, two, please. At least she's in your life. That's why a lot of Christians say, God's in my life. Well, that's a start, but he wants to be first place in your life. That's the goal is first place. And that's going to be the goal, goal of that girlfriend or their wife is first or nothing. Right? Ladies, amen that. <laughs> it's either you got to be his first in women priorities or it's going to be nothing whether you're second, third, fifth, or a hundred. In the same way with God, we have to set him as our priority. Now, we know the right answer to that. Is God first place in your life? I got the answer, Brother Tim. What? First? Well, that's the right answer. But is that the correct answer? It may be right, but is it correct? We always have things competing with God, especially in this American culture. We have more competing to where today you may have God first place, but Wednesday he may back, got down to third. See, this is a daily question. This isn't like, well, I answered that question last week. Well, no, it's daily. You have to ask yourself, is God first place today? at this moment in my practice, in my activity, in my behavior. You know, Yogi Berra, the great shortstop, one of the greatest players to play baseball, he played catcher. I said shortstop. He played catcher. And as a catcher, he said, one of the things catchers do is distract batters. He said, oh, uh, while I was down there in the plate, I'd say, you know, your mama, and he'd start talking about their mama, and, you know, I bet your wife's out at another ball game watching somebody else. I mean, he said, I messed with their mind. He said, I come up with all kind of lies. And that was his job. He's a catcher. He said, I'm a, you know, you don't ever hear that back there. There's no microphone back there. So he messed with him. Here comes Hank Aaron. So he knew he better mess with him good. So Hank, uh, watch your shoestrings. Maybe into, Hank, your bat, your, the lettering on your bat's backward. You know, those of us who've played baseball before, you know, you got to get the, the letters that are, engraved on the bat have to be on the right side or you'll crack the bat, you won't get it. Hank, look, don't, it's, you turned around backwards, you didn't check. Look, your lettering's backwards, you've got the letters backwards. Look, 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 look. Trying to think, well, no, maybe I did, you know, and if you took one little second or if you weren't confident, what if, you're not gonna be focused. Bam! Over the center field fence, home run. First, second, third, fourth, goes around home plate, pick up the bat, heads of the dugout, Turns back around, looks at 
Yogi Baron said, I didn't come to read. <laughs> See, he came to hit home runs. But the devil is behind your home plate constantly. A hobby's fun. Is there anything wrong with a hobby? No, it's fun. It's not immoral, ungodly. But when it begins to consume more and it takes God's place, it is. Is your career or your job? And your job's important. There's nothing ungodly about your job. Is it taking God's first place? It is then. The devil's always, constantly with your time, your talent, your trick. He's always like Yogi Berra, distracting us from wanting God. We have to tell him, we didn't come here to do that. We came here to love God. No matter what distractions are thrown our way. You know, the next one is passionate love is driven to know and to please the one loved. If you say anybody that you love, you want to know them better. Paul said of his goal in his heart that I may know him. I want to know him. I want to know all about him. Let's go back to the illustration of the, the girl the guy's wanting to date. He goes to her. And he says, okay, I want to get to know you, and whatever I can get to know you, for an hour and 45 minutes every Saturday, I'll know you. Anything more than that, I'm not going to call you, I'm not going to visit you, but for an hour and 45 minutes, maybe two hours every Saturday, I'll know as much as I can about you. You'd say, well, know as much as you can about the back of that door right there, because you need to head on. <laughs> I don't want to date anybody that's just going to give me an hour and 45, two hours every Saturday. But a lot of people say, God, I'll give you two hours on Sunday. And that's all you get to know you. That girl sent you out the room because that girl said, that's not love. That's all you want to get to know me? I don't want a relationship like that. And God wants us to know Him. And it takes time to know Him. You know, it also says in... 2 Corinthians 5, 9. You go back to that. It says, Therefore we also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to Him. You know, it goes without saying, hopefully, that the ones we love, we want to please. You know, Jesus was real strict on those Pharisees and those church leaders. He was telling them, you know, you would choose to please men rather than or more than God. They were men-pleasers. They wanted to please other people. Now, we all like to please other people. That's, he wasn't saying don't please other people. But when you got a choice to please a person or to please God, and you have to make a choice, you better choose God and displease a person. Because there'll be times of that if you love God. Because in a relationship... That guy would want to tell that girl, he's saying, look, I, I want to do things that please you. Or else he won't get her. Will he? <laughs> no, that's his goal. He wants to please. And if we look here, there's a couple of things that show what is. Well, first of all, to please, you must try to do what they like and avoid what they hate. True? I mean, that's why you're getting to know that person. You're saying, hey, I want to know your likes and your dislikes so that I can attempt to please you. It says in John 14, 50, if, if you love me, you will what? Well, the next few verses there, you can just go ahead and take it from here on out. Keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Now, see, Jesus said that, not me. And a lot of people say, Brother Tim, I'm not really keeping a lot of God's commandments. But you heard me in worship. I love him. Look, I didn't set this standard. See, if I tell you I like chocolate cake, don't make me vanilla cake because you like chocolate cake. Right? If I give the standard of what I like, give me what I like because what I like is what I like, not what you like. And so if God says, if you love me, here's how you show me that you love me. This is God speaking. Okay, God, I want to know you. What, what, what shows love? He said, keep my commandments. That's, that's what shows love for me. If we look at the next one, John 14, 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them is 
the one who loves me. He says it again. He's the one, how do you know love? It's the one who keeps the commandments. So we find out, God, what do you like? What do you dislike? Well, I'll tell you one thing God dislikes in Psalms 97.10. Hate evil, you who love the Lord. Now listen, we all may say we hate evil, but do we? You know, some of our pet peeves, sins, if we were honest, we may dislike them a little. We kind of don't want to do them, but we justify doing them. Because that person did this to me, so I did this to them. Lord, you understand. I mean, it's not that bad, because they did what they did, so, you know, and they were mean to me, so I was a little mean to them, and you know my schedule, and uh, you got to hate sin. I like what the Billy Sunday, the great evangelist in the early 1900s, when he was asked about sin, he said, I'm against it. He said, I'll kick it as long as I got a foot. I'll fight it as long as I got a fist. I'll butt it as long as I got a head. I'll bite it as long as I got a teeth. And when I'm old and footless and fistless and toothless, I'll gum it till I go home to glory. That's how much I hate it. <laughs> now that's how you look at sin. That's how mad you got to get at sin. I'm not going to, oh, I, you know, but do we get that mad? If God hates it, praise God, Billy Sunday hates it, and I ought to hate it. Hate it! But sometimes I don't. I may just say, what's so wrong with it? <laughs> what's so bad about it? Everybody else is doing it. I mean, at least I'm in church sometimes. I mean, oh, we can't love God without hating what He hates. The Bible says He hates evil. So any kind of sin, I've got to have that kind of passion against it as well. And then passionate love seeks close relations with those closest to the one loved. Back to the example of the guy trying to date the girl. He says, listen, let's get this clear up front. I know you love your parents and I know you love your relatives and all that, but rest assured, I'm not going to hang out with them in our relationship." I'm not going to be at your house. I'm not going to be around your relatives. It's just going to be you. I said, you're right. It is just going to be me. Head out the door because I'm not going to have a relationship with you. If you can't love the people I love, then you don't love me. Right? If they put that kind of standard on it, then it's really not love. And you can see there in verse 1 John 5, 1, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ, is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of Him. In other words, if you're a believer in Christ, you will love other believers. And you'll want to be around other believers. When I got right with God, the first thing I wanted was a Christian friend who loved God and would serve God and I could walk with because a lot of my failures were my, all my fault, but a lot of them were people I was hanging out with. Now, I don't blame them, I blame me. But when I began to hang around somebody that I could talk about the Lord, speak about the Lord, talk about some scriptures, and that was my running buddy, it was a lot easier. Because we, as Christians, have to love those who God loves. And that became, becomes God's family. This is His family. We all love His family. Be around His family. And to love Him, according to this, is to love His people. And to minister to His people. And do good things for His people. He loves that. Well, I'm not going to love him that way. This is the way he says he wants to be loved. Let's deal with it. He says, love my people. These are my people, so love them. And that's the way he deals with the love of one believer for another believer because in Christ, we are to seek other believers. We want to be around them. You know, before I got right with God, I really didn't really want to be in church. And then when God touched my heart and changed my heart, hey, I want to be not only in church, I want to be around other believers. And this is the love that God demonstrates in His Son for others in His house. You want to be in His house? You love being in His house? You love being around His people? Well, if you say you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, part of that's going to be 
I need to develop close friendships, close bonds with His people. And if I can't do that quickly by in and out of church, then I find a way to do it. Because I need to love other believers. And if that's a checklist of your life to say, you know, if I look at my life, I can say I love and minister and help to other believers in Christ. And if you do, you are fulfilling part of the loving God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then the fourth one, passionate love is sacrificial for the one loved. You cannot truly love unless you truly sacrifice. Let's go back to the dating situation. Guys, y'all learn some great points here when you start dating. So you go to the girl and you say, look, first of all, I'll be here to help you whenever I can as long as it's not after two in the morning. If you break down, if you have car trouble, if you're in dire need, never call me after two o'clock in the morning. And two, when we go out on a date, the maximum I will spend on any date with you is $5. <laughs> and we're gonna split gas. She's gonna say, that's not the only thing we're gonna split. We're gonna split up. Why, she don't wanna hear that you're not gonna sacrifice for her. Does she? See, the red flags are up, you're gone, you're toast. Because in her mind, love and sacrifice go together. So is true with the relationship with the Lord. Is love and sacrifice go together? Look at John 15, 13. It gives the measurement of love. Greater love has no one than this. That one lay down his life for his friends. Jesus is saying this, if you want to know a barometer of love, it's sacrifice. The greater the sacrifice, the greater the love. That's why nobody has greater love for Tim Strickland than Jesus Christ, because he's the only one that laid down his life for me. Amen? And you. That's why our people that are in the military we have such respect for, because they are putting their life on the line for our freedom. Because greater love has no man than to lay down their life. That's the greatest of all, love. So if you wanna know about love, then say, how much are they willing to sacrifice for me? And Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice for us. He laid down his very life. He couldn't have done any more. What more do you do after you lay down your life? You don't even have a life. You've given it. Praise the Lord, he was resurrected, but that's the most, that's the max, that's the maximum anybody can do. Michelangelo, it says, while he was painting the Sistine, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, I mean, back, back breaking work. I mean, it was physically terrible. I mean, can you imagine, even back then, the old scaffolding they'd have to be on your back and have to paint this giant Sistine Chapel, the ceiling upside down. I mean, it was just excruciating. And one man had come up to him, to Michelangelo, and said, this may cost you your life. And Michelangelo's answer was, what else is life for? I ask ourselves, what are we saving our life for? Retirement. I'm saving everything for retirement. And then what? You're gonna die in a few years anyway, you're gonna be dead. What are we saving everything for? What else is life for? I mean, we're saving it up for what? Michelangelo said, yeah, I'll die doing this. It'll probably kill me. But this is what else is life for. This is what my calling was, to paint this ceiling. What is our life for? Well, it will be called time to sacrifice the three T's. Your time, your talent, and your treasure. It will cost some things, because that's part of love. The greater the sacrifice, Jesus said, the greater the love. So we end up with looking at this question. Why am I, and I asked myself while I was preparing this, where are some areas, Lord, that I'm not passionately loving you? Isn't that a legitimate question we all need to ask ourselves? I'm not asking yours, and you're not answering for me. I'm not answering you. You've got to answer this one. You're the only one that can, and I'm the only one that can with me. You can't see my heart up here, and I can't see your heart down there. we all got to say, why? I think number one is I don't know how. Well, now you do. And now I do. We just saw the principles. 
the four principles of loving with all your heart, mind, and soul is all in what we just talked about. So now we know how. So we need to get out and do what it is that we're called to do. The second thing is, maybe we have a spiritual boyfriend, girlfriend. The Bible says, if you're a friend of the world, it talks about you're an enemy with God, and it goes on to speak of them as an adulterer. Meaning, if you have people, if you have things that are above first place in your life, that are above God, then you're an adulterer, and I'm an adulterer toward God. Things have taken our affection off. You look at a relationship where a couple, one of them has somebody on the side. You can't work with that couple because it's always a distraction because God's Word says you can't serve two masters for you begin to hate the one and love the other one and you'll begin to cling to the one and despise the other. It's just spiritual adultery and it happens to us. It doesn't mean even today you make the commitment to do it. Tomorrow, the next day, you may not have to renew. So wait, wait, wait. This is taking too much of my time or too much of my energy or too much, you know what I mean? It's just making me an adulterer. It's like I've got a girlfriend, boyfriend on the side. And if that's happening, if you're putting hobby, career, sports, fame, personalities, whatever before God, then there you go. There I go. I won't be passionately loving God anymore. That's just all there is to it. That's what happens. That's part of life. The third thing is, you have a known sin in your life. You won't get it right before God. In other words, yes, God cleanses us from all our sin at salvation. It's all positionally, we're perfect before God. But practically, if there's bitterness I'm holding towards somebody, if there's anger I have towards somebody, if I'm not right with somebody, if I'm involved in the sin that I don't want to get rid of, if I'm doing something I know God doesn't want me to do, that's going to squelch my passion. That's going to pour fire on the passions of love for God. Even the movie that was about Christ was the passion of the Christ. Fire, passion. It's what he has love for me. But when I have sin in my life that I don't get right, my passion just, like water, it just pours on it and the fires are well out. Just not any passion there. And the last one is, are we not a Christian? I mean, you start from that one. I mean, you have no love for God or no passion at all or no desire to serve the Lord at all. And, I mean, you've got to start with this one. What Jesus did for us is the whole motivation of whatever we do for Him. I love Him, the Bible says, because He first loved me. I mean, I can't even love back unconditionally. I love back conditionally. The Bible tells me that. I love him because he first loved me. <laughs> That's how wicked I am. I can't even generate love. All I can generate is love back because of what he's already done to love me. You know, he told Simon that. Remember, he, Simon, he, he told the, the illustration about the parable. He said, you know, there were two men that owed a man money. One 50 denaria, one 500 denaria. And we base that around $11 or somewhere in there an hour today because it was, denarius was a day's wage. So if we just kind of averaged it, maybe we could say maybe one guy owed him $60,000 and one guy owed him $6,000. $60,000, 6000 And Jesus said, if the man told both these men, you don't owe me anything and you don't owe me anything, the debt's been canceled. 60,000 wiped clean. 6,000 wiped clean. Jesus asked Simon, who would love the man more? Simon said, well, I guess the one who was wiped out the biggest debt, the $60,000 man again. And Jesus said, you've answered correctly. He would love him more because he would be most grateful for what happened. That doesn't mean some of us has $60,000 worth of sin that caused Jesus to die on the cross and some have 6000 Every bit of our sin, no matter small, little, big, whatever, caused Jesus to die on the cross. But how grateful you are for what he did. I mean, there's people that grew up in church who didn't go out and live the wise who just love God with all their heart. And there's people that's been murderers, rapists, robbers who love God. Why? Because of our gratitude for what he did and the gratitude for what he's doing is our basis 
of why we love him and why we'll sacrifice for him and why we'll do what we need to do for him. I can't remember what movie it was, but it was an old one. And it was a Western, and it was, uh, it was a movie about back in the gold rush days. And this guy had been shot, and he was about to die, and this old doctor back there who was, had a little shack there in the gold town found the man near death. He didn't even know he could save him. He got him. He, he took him back to his shack, and he, he took the bullet out or whatever the deal was and, and doctored him, and it still didn't look like he was going to survive. It was days and days before he even came back out. And he came back to, and the doctor fed him and gave him water and nursed him back to health. So after like a month or so, he's back well. He's alive. So this guy in this movie, you know, tells the doctor, look, I, I don't have any money. I mean, you found me just how you found me. There ain't a nickel on me. All I have is the clothes that was on my body. I have no horse. I have no possessions. I have nothing. So I, I don't know how to pay your bill back. I'm going to pay your bill for you being a doctor. I don't. Doctor said, okay. I, you know, all my life I've always wanted an assistant. You know, I'm a doctor here in this little bitty small town, and I'd like to have an assistant. So I'll tell you what we'll do. If you want to pay me back, you be my assistant. I said, okay, now I have a question to you. How long do I need to be your assistant if this is our deal? <laughs> I love his answer back. The doctor looked at him and said, I want you to be my assistant for as long as you would have been dead if I wouldn't have saved you. <laughs> I'm going to say that again. I want you to be my assistant for as long as you'd have been dead if I wouldn't have saved you. I can't stop serving the Lord. I can't pay Him back. I couldn't if I wanted to. But I'd have been dead, especially in my sins. I wouldn't have had a restored family. I'd have probably been dead physically. And I can't go on and on and on of what God saved me and done for me. I'm not saying I don't go through difficulties. I have some difficulties. I have some current difficulties. But when you look at what all God has done for you and for me. Well, Brother Tim, I went to college to get my job. God gave you brain cells so you could get through college. I worked hard for what I got because God gave you breath in those lungs for you to go to work. You'd have nothing if God says today, boom, you breathe no more. If he quits this earth spinning just a little bit, we're flying off. Everything we have is God's. And just like I have to look at God saying, I serve you as long as I'd have been dead in my sins if you wouldn't have died for me on the cross. Because love is true love when it's grateful for what the one that they love has done. And nobody has done more for me and you than Jesus. And if you think it, look around. Even in our worst situations, we look around and we see how good God is to us. Even when He lets us go through things we'd rather not be in our life. And I'm no different. Don't think I'm up here saying, oh, God answers everything. Oh, man, He's got everything out bad that I've had. No, there's some things even God has done like he did with Paul, said, I'm leaving that. I don't care if you paid three or 103 times, it's staying. Because it's going to glorify me. How grateful are we for what God has done? Part of that is the motivation to love him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our strength how we think, how we feel, the decisions we make, and the energy and effort and time that we give Him. All of it. To be wholly committed. Just like I look back is when God said, look how what happened when you did that in motocross. What will happen if you'll do that in my kingdom work? You'll have that same attitude, that same passion, 
And you all know what it is. I mean, it can be flooding and people will make it down to the sports arenas and drive through high water and flood out. Four drops of rain, people turn around and go back home from church. Passion. Passion. What has he done for me? He's done it all. What do I have he didn't give me? Nothing. So with great gratitude comes great love. Is it there? You'll probably have to do what I did in preparation of this, saying, God, what is it in me that is not passion for you? And what is the reason? Show me. And he'll be faithful to do it. With every head bowed and every eye closed as you stand to your feet.